Hey, friends, welcome to another episode of the Power of Nine podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Eggert. Today's guest is a sales machine. He spent his entire career mastering the craft of sales and has now built a platform called Closers Media that teaches and inspires his passion for driving revenue. We'll unwind all that with our guest today, Mikolai Bedore. Mikolai, how you doing, buddy? I'm wonderful, man. How you doing? I, uh, uh, I, I, you have a radio voice. Like oh, I always thought you had a face for radio, but now, now I can hear the radio voice in you, man. It's, it's a beautiful thing. Well, well done. Uh, you you've asked me to pinch hit for you a couple times in the past and now I think I know why is and it, it probably doesn't have anything to do with my personality probably just my fancy radio voice <laughs> I think so you know I was telling my wife I was like I wish that every day would be like a podcast because I love being a podcast for those introductions where you're like Oh, I feel great. <laughs> How about this? I'll just cut it when I do the editing. I'll cut it and then I'll just save that that intro. And then you can make that your wake up music on your cell phone when you wake up every morning. <laughs> yes. Deal. Can you imagine how big my head would be then? I'd be like, oh, I am so awesome. I'm going to crush this day. Yeah. Everyone's going to dislike me in the process. No, man, uh, I, I appreciate those kind words. Thank you. Honored to be uh, on the yeah, show. Man. Well, I'm super pumped to have you on. Uh, I like to start out... You and I met uh, many moons ago, probably five, six years ago. Uh, we hit it off right off the bat. I think it was at some kind of a uh, networking event. I don't really remember what it was. And we've become really good friends. And for people that don't really know us, I was just looking at, I was doing, I don't know why I do this crazy shit, but I was looking at LinkedIn uh, prior to jumping on our podcast. And we have 292 mutual connections. That's when we, you know, we spend maybe a little too much time together. <laughs> I wonder when that with LinkedIn breaks, you know what I mean? Like when somebody right. has so many connections that the connection <laughs> becomes like, 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 like a electrical outlet. That's, you know, like kind of fuzzing a little bit. I wonder when, when LinkedIn just shuts down because of, uh, of that, cause that's gotta be some sort of record, right? Well, I, I think actually what happens is they send you a notification and it says you and Mikolai Bedore should get an apartment together. <laughs> <laughs> that would be the best and worst thing ever. <laughs> Uh, all right. So we've known each other for a long time. And, and as our listeners will hear, we are able to just kind of kind of go into spontaneous random conversations. So I am going to try and keep it relatively structured. Right. I do want to start out with uh, a lot of people don't get to see the side of you of like your your upbringing. And I like to talk a little bit. Of, I may not use these words, but nature versus nurture. And especially with you being a guy that's a uh, a sales guy, not coming from a sales guy type family. Mm -hmm. I, I like to dig into all that stuff. So tell me a little bit about your upbringing and what it was like uh, to grow up where you grew up. So yeah, I grew Thanks for asking. I don't get to share this a whole lot. I grew up in a town called Rolog. I graduated from a town called Holly, which is about 1500 people that's outside of Detroit Lakes, Minnesota. I actually, I think we're closer to Detroit Lakes. So I always say no one's ever heard of Rolog because it's not a, yeah. a real town. It's like a village. My mom was a postmaster. So she's very peculiar. It's like a grammar mom or like a grammar teacher for a mom. It's always like, no, 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 that's a village. Like we technically live in a village here in little Canada because we don't have a post office. Right. right. Yeah. That's I didn't what know defines that. it. Interesting. Yeah. I didn't either oh. until well, I did know that. I don't know why I just said that. I think I just mirrored you for no reason. Anyway, um, so yeah, we grew up uh, on nine acres out in the country. Uh, we had a creek that I went by our house that connected to the lake that we lived on. My grandpa was a farmer, so he owned a bunch of land around lakes, and he just gave it away basically because he didn't swim. He, so he just found no value in the lakes. Um, Crazy. Which would have probably made me turn out to be a turd if I would have in inherited all that so that everything works out but yeah, yeah grew up on nine acres um we had four wheelers we shot guns we threw rocks at each other we had a bb gun fights um and there was about you know there was about four other kind of families so it was kind of a few lakes um lake 10 was the name of ours and lake 15 was across the way and lake seven yeah so there's we we lived in a, a, like the heart of lakes basketball conference if you will yeah. so it was just lakes everywhere and um, a lot of our friends lived on lakes and the lake has always been a huge part of my life. So I spent a lot of time with these kids and free range parenting, as, as we used to call it. My parents both worked the same job basically for 30 years and they, it was a nine to five. So they, in the summer would just let us go nuts. And uh, we fished, we, we literally played a game called running man where we'd throw rocks at each other. We'd be begin fights. Like I said, yeah, I don't know how we didn't die, but we didn't. And uh, yeah, it kind of defined me. 
it's a real yeah. small town, 52 kids in, in our class. But um, the lake was, I mean, we crushed that lake, whether it was hockey, ice fishing, year round fun, man. It was our playground. Yeah, you, you're you one of those people that it you have such a passion for the outdoors, specifically around lakes. So anytime mm -hmm. you jump on your Instagram, you're either at wintertime, you're ice fishing, uh, or your kids are skate, you know, like this last winter, your kids were learning how to skate. And then, yeah. uh, and then you know, I know you're a huge, huge into boating, and, and you love that atmosphere. And so that's all got to be a big part of, of your culture growing up. Uh, what did your parents do? So my mom was uh, she, she kind of she was a postal worker. So she yep. started as like an intern um, and uh, built her way up to being a regional. I don't know what the name of it was, but she knew where like literally every post office was in a tri-state area. And that was a really big achievement for her because it, that back in the day, uh, like that wasn't a job that a woman had. It sounds <laughs> crazy to say today, but mm -hmm. that was, that was not a thing. And because of her travel schedule, she actually took a demotion to be a post master, which is the person mm -hmm. that runs the post office uh, of Moorhead, Minnesota, which is outside of Fargo. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, an accomplishment itself because she also was one of the first female postmasters in a, you know, in that section of the United States. So that was a really cool thing. So I, I grew up with a very strong mom. My dad was uh, worked on the railroad his entire life. So he was a, what they call a car knocker. Um, that's the person that goes, uh, out when middle of the night, freezing cold up there, uh, to go help a rail or sorry, fix a rail line, or, you know, if, if there's a derailment or whatever, he was kind of like the, the, the Marines of the car knocks were like the Marines of, uh, <laughs> of the railroad. Yeah. And then Special his forces. last, oh yeah, this is a gnarly job. But, um, and then the last few years, uh, before he retired, uh, he was a foreman which he was very good at, but didn't want to be, um, yeah. because he, how he led was, I'm not going to, manage you. I'm not going to babysit you, but I'll show you what to do. So he kind of led by example, which mm. I definitely has infiltrated our, our training and some of the stuff that we do, yeah. but yeah, man. So that's, yeah. and, 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 you know, lake lovers themselves. I mean, that's why we're, we feel really blessed to, to live on the lake in two different areas in Montana and here, but yeah. lake is, it isn't just a cool thing for us. It's like, it's who we are. So my dad in his off time now he fishes, I think he fishes like three, at least three times a week. Sweet. Loves it. Good for so, him. Good. Yeah. You know, he's, he's earned it. Oh, yeah. They right. both have. Right, right, <laughs> for right. sure. Yeah. So uh, when did you start? When you were growing up, did you have any type of uh, exposure to any type of sales at all? You know, no, which is why I think I took to it. So I was getting in trouble a lot in high school. Imagine that for Shocker. talking and not following rules and whatever. And then my uncle, when I was 14 years old, my uncle Jana um, invited me on a sales like a sales day. Cause he was, he was, he was the reason why I started learning guitar. And at the time he was helping me train for my upcoming cross country, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, season. And then we were, I was getting my 14. I would have been probably a blue belt. I think I was getting my blue belt or something in Taekwondo. Mm -hmm. He was our instructor. So we were really tight and he goes, Hey, come on over. Um, we'll, I'll, I'll pick you up. We'll, uh, <laughs> we'll, um, we'll go on some sales calls and I'll give you a free pop. So he <laughs> loved like diet mountain dew i mean like a junkie like he had to actually quit it you know what i mean oh, like a, yeah, like right. somebody would quit smoking or whatever he had to quit it because he was drinking yeah. so many of them um and then free lunch and so we went on these sales calls he sold bernatello's pizza and we go to all these places and they're like jana they like hug him and i'm like what the hell is this and he's like <laughs> it's my job i'm like wait you know i'm like, like when does the hard work start he's like just help me ca carry these pizzas in i'm like and then when does the real work start yeah yeah then we're gonna go have lunch with these guys you jerk, you, you know, turd, whatever, just joking around. I'm like, wait, this is your job. Like you get paid money to do, to do this. I'm like, well, whatever this is, I'm in. Yeah. And I, I remember it just kind of gave me a whole new lease on life. Cause I was like, I mean, you know, it's 52 kids in my class and this wasn't a private school. This is the only school in Hall or, you know, in Holly. And I'm like, okay, so we got the dairy queen that was just being built. We got, no, it was the tasty freeze. We got the tasty freeze. We got the, you know, the auto shop and or i could ro join the railroad i mean it was like i didn't know what i was going to do and then i and saw the this post office and the post well yeah the post <laughs> well, office yeah. you're right yeah, yeah. <laughs> but i, I wasn't gonna work for my mom I, I already i already did on the weekend you know they cut wood and all that stuff but um yeah so i found sales to be a thing and i told him hey I, can i like do this now because <laughs> i right. can do this in school it's what i'm getting in trouble for so i'm pretty good at it you know <laughs> he's like well yeah 
So then he had me selling pizza. So, you know, the pr- people like at Costco that would like cook a pizza yeah. and you just eat it and then samples, then you go away. Yeah. Well, I don't know why, but I thought I, I worked way too hard at it. Cause I saw what he did. I'm like, I'm just going to do that. So then I would sell the pizzas. I'd be like, you know, it's two for five or whatever, five or 10. And you look like somebody that loves, you know, whatever. And I would like schmooze them, the old ladies and the retired guys. And uh, we would sell out of pizzas. Like, so they, then they would sort of give me like a little bit of spiff if, if, if I would sell out a freezer, because the people were calling him going, Johnny, you got to get here. Your, your nephew just sold out our pizzas again. And that wasn't the thing, right? And, you know, was I good at it? Probably not. I was probably awful, but I was young and I had braces and, you know, <laughs> I probably looked harmless and it was two for five. It was a hell of a deal, you know? So everybody yeah, wins. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then you decided that you were going to go to, uh, you're not going to go too far away. So you decided to go to North Dakota there in Fargo, yeah. right? Yep. And then- no, no, no. I went to uh, Grand Forks, North Dakota, which is about two and a half hours away. So it was- Oh, you did go to Grand Forks? Yeah. Yep. Oh, sweet. Fighting All right. Sioux fan. All right. Yo, well, what are they called now? Who cares? We don't, <laughs> we don't talk about that. Uh, the fighting Hawks. They're called the Hawks. Is it but, the Hawks? All right. You know, like yeah. when you're, when you, when you graduate, I mean, that'd be like, uh, you yeah. go to Notre Dame and they change the name to, you know, the dogs. You're like, right. no, I'm always going to be Irish forever. You know, right. it's like, so. Right. Yeah. Anyway. Well, I know anybody who's a hockey fan too gets really passionate about the whole name change and stuff and and probably because they had to buy new jerseys and all that stuff. But uh, yeah. so you, all right, so Grand Forks. And then when you went to college, you had a plethora of sales related gigs. And so, yeah. uh, I mean, just rattle through, some, I'll rattle through some of these. So we were doing our prep call and it, mm-hmm. it's advertising and you did music promotion, you sold booze. Uh, you had a summer gig where uh, you worked for Southwestern Books and you were selling books door to door and you were doing yeah. some traveling. Like what what an interesting bunch of gigs that you had there. I, what, uh, so of all those things I rattled off, which one of those was your absolute favorite and which one was a complete like I never want to do that again? Well, you, you know me and some of your listeners might as well. Clearly no second place for this one. My favorite was selling booze at happy Harry's. It was the <laughs> funnest job still to this date. I think I've ever had. And this one's, this one's a close second. It's pretty good, but that was so, so much fun because, uh, it, w- cause we had to make it fun retail. You know, if you're in your feet for eight hours, that sucks. And so what we would do is, I don't know why, but happy Harry's was like, Oh, we are not a liquor store. Mm-mm. We're a bottle shop. Right. And so they had all this other crap, like pickled quails, quick sorry quail eggs and yeah. hot sauce and a couple of things that we used to do is one of the big tricks there was uh and then they had little minis so and in north dakota you could sell everclear right so all right. the canadians would come down and buy it but what we would do is on saturday mornings if we'd see somebody that looked hung over we would take some everclear and we would put it into their uh their pop because we got free pop you, you know we weren't supposed to drink on the job Obviously we did, but we weren't supposed to. And um, we had to pay for that, but the pop we got for free. So we'd put Everclear in there, pop, you know, and then, and then we'd like leave it back at the till. And sure enough, I've saw some people get sick. And then, and then we'd also <laughs> take the hot sauce. There was a thing called da bomb. That was like crazy hot. Like you, yeah. you, you for a bowl of chili, they'd suggest a, a toothpick of it. So what we do is we put that on the inside of their pop <laughs> thing. So when they take a drink, they go, ah, I mean, we, we made up a game for everyone's birthday because we hated stocking Mezcal, those Mezcal minis, minis, cause sorry, we, we stocked them, but no one, like no one moved them and they kept ordering Mezcal. And we're like, buddy, stop ordering all this Mezcal. No one is buying these minis. So what we did just to be turds is for your birthday. Oh, and it's in the pickled quail eggs. We're like, stop <laughs> ordering these things. Cause we couldn't yeah. find a place to put them. No one wanted them. So what we do is for your birthday, you'd come in and we'd ding the bell three times and go, Hey, we got a birthday. And we'd sing happy birthday and we'd make them take a knee and take the mezcal shot and Sick. eat a pickled quail egg as part of happy Harry's <laughs> birthday ritual. And that was completely made up so much so that three years later, my buddy who still worked there was like, buddy, you guys are gone and graduated, but people still come in and ask. They bring their buddies for the for the happy Harry's birthday ritual. Their birthday shot, sick. That's <laughs> disgusting. I, I've never gotten any of that that stuff, uh, especially the pickled Ugh. quail eggs. Icky. Hard no, yeah, no. Uh, how about the worst gig? Oh, selling books door to door. I mean, and I don't I don't know about you, but I don't go to work and get guns pulled on me or <laughs> bit by goats. I literally got bit by a pygmy goat and a, and, and a couple dogs. It was, and I was out, so story, I don't know if you guys know, Southwestern is like, it's, 
it's a call. It used to be like a college. I actually don't know if it's but college kids will go to Nashville, Tennessee. They'll train us on this this system. Okay. Yeah. No, hundred percent commission. And then so you got to pay for that. Then they give you a, a territory that is not your home state. So mine was Appalachia, Ohio, which might have been seen out of deliverance. And um, <laughs> we have to go find our own place to live, mind you, what? right? Yeah. So we had a sweet talk. We we lived in a college. We lived on a college campus. Um, so that was awesome. But anyway, in uh, Columbus, Ohio, whatever that, oh, uh, we went to Ben Ohio state. It was the other one with the uh, Bobcat. Is it Ohio? Anyway, it doesn't matter. Oh, I think Miami, so. Ohio. I think, nope, it was OU. It was OU. That's where it was. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, uh, anyway, yeah. And then, then we'd have our territories. We'd, you know, we'd get up at five, take cold showers, do push ups, and then we'd have to run our own business. So every Friday we'd submit or sorry, every Sunday, because we worked six days a week, and we got one day off, we'd submit our reports. We, we learned we learned basic accounting, how to run a business. Uh, we obviously learned sales. Yeah. But that was the worst job, bar none, because I could have died easily. It was, oh, that's a, that's a rough, rough yeah. part of the country. But the good news is I killed it. And I, and I got President's Club there. That was my first President's Club. And Cause I was heads down. I was like, this place sucks. And I, I drank the Kool-Aid. I injected the Kool-Aid. Like I was yeah. so into like the routines and the, and the discipline. I don't know why. I mean, that's an undisciplined kid, but you know, I just totally dug it. Yeah. I, and I, I just drank the Kool-Aid. I was like, well, for the one time in my life following the rules and it got me to president's club and we got to go to the, no, it was the Cayman islands. We got to the Cayman islands, Sweet. you know, and I was like 19 or something, yeah. right. You know, and it was awesome. And I'm like, so sales just kept getting better. You know what I mean? I was like, man, this, this is that sucked, but this is awesome. Yeah. And um, yeah, but it was pff, worst job ever. I mean, what was but it your, taught me a lot. So what, what was your first gig out of college then? So uh, during college, you said music promoter. I was the guy that booked for, for, for you. It's only like a two year stint. So I think you only get two years and then someone else takes your spot, but uh, on student government, but it was uh, uh, booking the music. So I was the music promoter for UND for a couple of years, I got to actually meet blues traveler, which back then I, I still now I play harmonica and, and guitar and write songs. And, and I mean, nobody plays harmonica, like, like John Popper. And he signed my, my harmonica, which was good and bad. Cause then he signed, I'm like, wait a minute, this is my only harmonica. Damn it. So then I had to go buy one and you know, 20 bucks back then was like a hundred today. Right. So anyway, um, uh, did that and then got to work with a lot of, uh, agencies. So I had some interest and it was I, not to sound like a, Breger, but um i worked really hard at that job i really loved that job um mm. and so and i and, and when i say my favorite because it was i didn't i didn't get paid to do it and it wasn't really it was kind of a sales gig but it was more of like organizing stuff and um calendars and whatnot so i, I got good at it we booked some good bands i made some really good relationships with some of the agencies and when i was up to graduate the agencies are like hey you should come work for us and one of them was in i think la or or I think it was Arizona. One of them was here in the, in the cities. And then um, mm -hmm. the other one was uh, out in New York in, in, in Rockland County. So right across the GW bridge from Manhattan. And uh, I was like, well, hell, I've never been in New York. I'll just go there. And I took, so I took that job and I was out there for a handful of years. It was, it was super awesome, but the lifestyle was ridiculous. Like even right. for a 21 year old, I was like, Whoa, yeah. I'm going to go take a nap. I don't know <laughs> what you guys are doing. It was crazy. <laughs> and Manhattan was crazy. I'll never forget the first time my boss didn't drive. So we went into the city all the time to, to check out live acts. And I remember driving down. If anyone's ever been driving on the GW bridge, going into Manhattan, and it's not like you ease into Manhattan. It's like someone just takes a rock and throws it into Manhattan. And all of a sudden there's doors flinging over cars are honking. People are walking across and mind you, I learned how to drive in a town of 1500 people on nine acres. And then I went to North Dakota, which was just a little bit bigger than that. <laughs> and then right. Manhattan, I'll never forget the driving experience. I, it scared the hell out of me. Every time she's like, all right, we get to go to the city again. I'm like, Oh God, do I have to drive. <laughs> yep. I'm like, Oh, I don't know. Yeah. Potholes. I mean, if you ever, Oh yeah, that was freaky, but that was a fun job. That was a fun what, job. What, uh, how long, did you, how much time did you spend there? So I was in Manhattan for a little bit and then they uh, transferred us, to, they, we moved the agency to Philly and I was in Philly for all that. I, you know, Philly's got a bad rap. It's true, but um, <laughs> I lived in Delaware. Uh, actually, uh, our president uh, was 
what was he a senator back then in in Wilmington I lived right outside of Wilmington in a town called Newark Delaware again on a college campus yeah I literally lived on a college campus with a college person and would go to college football games and got to see Joe Flacco who, who oh, played yeah. for the, the Blue Hens then he was like watching a Tecmo game he would just cock back and launch the ball I've never I mean he was like it was like a like a grown man playing against just children like he was clearly going I think he was a first round draft pick, wasn't he? Yeah, well, I, I think he, yeah, he, I think he was right up there, right? He was, yeah. he won a Super Bowl. I know that. And your, your comment about Philly is true to form being a Vikings fan. <laughs> just, just dog shit. But anyway, I, I loved, <laughs> I loved the, uh, the cheesesteaks and the music scene was good. I mean, not all of it was gross, but, you know, like we went to Philly's games and I saw U2 for the first time there at Pepsi. No, that's in Denver, somewhere else in Philly, whatever their arena is. And, you know, it wasn't all bad, but there is it, stereotypes don't create themselves. And that place definitely lives up to the stereotype. I'll just is, leave it at uh, that. Are you a believer that the real cheesesteak has got cheese whiz on it? Yes. Without question. Like there's a couple of places here that have that. I will not eat it. I won't even, I won't even, I'll say, I'll take the sandwich with the fake, with the real cheese and beef on it. If, if I order one here, they're like, you mean the, the Philly? I'm like, no, this is not a Philly. This right. is not a Philly cheesesteak. <laughs> this is a bun with meat in it with a bunch of obnoxious things that they don't really put on a Philly cheesesteak. So no, <laughs> I will not call it a Philly cheesesteak. I did love those. I yeah, loved those. those. And, and Pat's, Pat's was my favorite. And then across the street was Gino's. I loved Pat's, Jimmy's, then Gino's. And it was two different people. You were either a Pat's person or a Gino person because Pat's was like just a like a RV that you just go up and and, and get it and then, <laughs> and then uh, Gino's had like all the lights and all the fanciful stuff and it was just like nope I'm a Pat's guy you're a Gino's guy well then we're not going to get along that's how that's, Philly was it was so funny <laughs> it's like pizza in, in New York you, you know they've got the different kinds of New York pizza you go to get pizza in Chicago you've got Malnati's and Pizzeria Uno and I mean it's awesome day. I didn't know that there was two separate places that had their own rendition of it and I love that Oh, buddy, they're across. If you Google it, they're across the street. They face each other. <laughs> oh, I love it. That's, yeah. that's how you compete face to face every day. Oh, it was hilarious. And it was, and you know, I didn't care. They <laughs> tasted all the same. It was just cheese was and meat, like good Lord. But yeah. uh, I, I was a Pat's guy. So that made me Pat guy type friends. And then Gino's people had Gino's and you, you know what I mean? And it was just like right, a rivalry. Right. It, was right. so, it was so, it was so. As bad as St. Paul and Minneapolis, it was like that. So, uh, well, speaking of good, uh, good transition there, what brought you back to the Twin Cities? What brought you back to Minnesota? Oh, Philly. I mean, honestly, like it was, well, it was, I was traveling like, cause I was so young and, and I saw all the, uh, I oversaw the college part of Auburn Moon Agency. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I was responsible for most of the, the college art. What was I again? Yeah. I don't remember. It was a sector that I oversaw. It was super fun, but, but, uh, basically lifestyle. I mean, I was, I was traveling all the time. And when I come home, I was on a college campus. So you can imagine what we did at night. Um, you know, basically an extension, which I already did five years at UND because I did the victory lap because I changed majors. So, you know, seven years of college, like I just was like, I got to get out of this lifestyle. This is, right. this is, this is too much. Um, yeah. So I, I was like, I think I'm going to settle up and, and get out of the East coast and uh, come back to, to, um, to Minnesota. And that was my first time Li sort of living in Minneapolis. I got a job at Verizon, but then I got a promotion six months later and uh, the opportunity to stay in the cities was there or I could go to Denver. And I was mm -hmm. like, well, I've never been to Denver. Let's check that out. And so I went to Denver for a bunch of years and that was really fun. Yeah. And, uh, and then what brought you back? So you spent some time at Verizon in Denver. What brought you back to the Twin Cities um, uh, after that? Ah, uh, well, and it's kind of full circle because I'm going to go spend a little more time with this guy, but um. I loved living in Denver. Like that could have been my jam forever. I had the best friends out there. We were, I learned how to play guitar. So we were playing gigs all the time with, with, with some guys and um, had a great house, $700 for rent back then, which today is like right. 7,000 Denver, just totally hockey sticked after we, I moved out, but um, great house, great, everything going on. But the temptation to play music professionally was still there. Like as a kid in high school, I played in a, in a band with, a guy named Matt that my parents didn't go to college. So they're like, you're going to go to college and you're going to pay for it. And I was like, Oh, 
uh, <laughs> I want to be in a band with that guy though. And they're like, that's never going to work out. And then he went and got signed by so- Sony records or oh, something man. afterwards. So it did work out, but um, <laughs> I still that itch. Cause I was like, damn it. I, I loved playing music. That was like my thing. I, that's, that was my identity really. You know, I had the hair, like I thought it was way cooler than I was. I wore like those kind of hippie shirts that you get from uh, like a secondhand store. Like, yeah, I, yeah, was, I was, yeah, I was yeah. all in it. And um. And then going and repping musicians as an entertainment agent in Manhattan, you know, that was, that didn't help either. Right. right. Um, so we, um, so yeah, so I came back, well, my, so my buddy's like, Hey, uh, you know, Kellen just moved to the cities or whatever. You should come up, you should come back up and we'll, we'll, we'll be in a band. And I was like, oh, the band from college. That'd be great. <laughs> That'd be awesome. And so I moved from Denver to do that. And then one of my best buddies who was in the band goes, Hey, I got some crazy news. And I was like, what? We got another gig. He's like, no, I'm moving to Australia. I got a promotion. And I'm like, Oh my God. So six months into it, I was like, why? We were just getting, we were just getting going. Yeah. And then it just yeah. like, just like regret just surges through your veins. And you're like, you know, cause you, you learn, and that wasn't the only reason I'm making this, I'm embellishing the story right. a little bit, but right. like, it really was a major reason. Cause like in Denver, I, I, you know what I mean? Like we didn't have bad bandmates. I probably could have found them. And I think deep down, I missed the lakes and family and, and friends and stuff. Cause the lakes out there, like I had to drive to Frisco to get my mm-hmm. fix, mm-hmm. but I did get my fix. I needed it. I, there's something with the lake that I, I have to have it around me just to kind of calm my, my soul, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So then I moved back and after, we've been here ever since. So did you, um, so when you came back, you, the band broke up, right? Cause your buddy had to leave. Uh, and then you, is that when you started at McKinley? Oh at yeah. So, so that was kind of the play there is I went to work for the McKinley group, which at the time yeah. was the largest headhunting agency in the state, at least the state. And I thought when I was deciding to move back, I went, I went there with one of my trips from Denver and, you know, I was like, yeah, you can help me get a job or whatever. And then they're like, well, you know, you seem like you could fit in here. And I was like, yes, I should work here so that I get paid to network in a city that I've never lived in. I mean, technically, like, technically I have, but like I hadn't lived more yeah. than six months. And I was at the point in my career, where I was, I was not quite 30, but I was, I was pushing 30 a little bit. And I'm like, man, I got to get my network down. And I planned on, you know, planning on staying here for good. So that was the, that was the play there. And I did that. And it was awesome until 2008 or whatever yeah. it was, 2009, whenever the market crashed. And that, then that job became, I mean, obsolete. Like, you know what I mean? Right. Nobody was hiring. So right. uh, that was a, a crazy time. That's for sure. Well, then you spent, uh, I'm just going to run through a two, two to three year stints at the following organizations, uh, Concur, Oracle, IBM. So, uh, yeah. and we were talking about this and I, and I know this about you is that you know, you basically go there, you crush it, you get president's club, you get bored, you move on and yep. then rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. Right. And so, yep. uh, now while you were at IBM, you started to get a little bit of inspiration from the time that you spent at McKinley and then all of the things that you were doing, crushing it over and over and over to then come up with this brainchild that was uh, BBG, Bador business group. Yeah. And so, so talk about the vision at that time, what that was, what that was to be and, and what it started out as, and then what it kind of wound down as before you started uh, what you have going on now. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, what, when I, when we say crush it, I had to crush it because when I was in Manhattan, I, no one, we didn't talk about politics or uh, money management when I was a kid. It just, it wasn't good or bad. It just, no one talked about it back then. And, uh, so I didn't know anything about compound interest. And so I racked up a heap of credit card debt because that, that summer that I, that I made all that money at, at, at uh, Southwestern, I just didn't stop spending like I had all that money. Do you know what I mean? And that right. just went through, through to, to concur basically where, you know, I racked up a bunch of credit card debt in Manhattan, came back, then went to Denver and did the same, except I was making a good, I was making good money out there. I couldn't, that was my second presence club, I think. Um, but I was blowing, you know, it's, it's, it's plain demand. Right, right, <laughs> so, right. so then, so then, then I come back to Minnesota and you know, the market crashes. So my job that was paying me good, just started to pay me nothing because it was a draw base. And, yeah. um, 
And then my friend went over to concur because at that point we're like, all right, I, we got to make a move here. And I got into software sales and I went to work under my friend who worked at McKinley and that was it. And so I saw the opportunity to take on awful territories. So that was, I, that's what I know, just taking garbage territories or industries and turning them into profit centers. And mm -hmm. so we won a couple awards there. Then I got, oh, so how, how, how Oracle happened was kind of wild. I was at Concur and um, they just wouldn't, they wouldn't promote in, in, internal people. I think that's changed since, but uh, I was getting frustrated. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go on vacation and I'm going to go to Australia. And I'm like, I'm going to go and burn all my vacation this trip to, to Australia. So I went there with, with some buddies who happened to be uh, software leaders, VPs, directors, or whatever in hiring positions. And we're out monkeying around in Sydney or Bondi or where, I don't know where the hell we were. But anyway, we rented an RV. It was 20 dudes. <laughs> it was so much fun. And we went up the coast. It's great. And then I That's met great. up with my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, up in Port Douglas, I think, um, outside of Cairns. But anyway, um, <clears throat> we're sitting there talking in this, because there was a lot of road tripping, right? And I was like, I just cannot, they just, bugging me out and blah, blah, blah. And then they're like, well, dude, if you are interested, we will hire you. Like you should come to Oracle. You would kill it at Oracle. And they were right. And the reason was, because I had to, still had to pay on this credit card debt and I was kind of pissed off. So I had, to, I had a chip on my shoulder. So what we did well, in the 30 days, we talked about it. Then back in the day, went to like an internet cafe. So, so got it approved, got the processing, got me on a team. So when I came back to concur, I was like, hey, is that promotion still up? And they're like, <laughs> well, and I go, never mind, I'm quitting. So I put in my two weeks and went to Oracle and hit Presence Club. And that's where that was like the, the true taste of, okay, this is the second time I've done this. Cause at Concur, mm -hmm. we turned these territories that were garbage into like 300%, something crazy. I don't remember. And then we went to Oracle and it was an industry patch that um, I, I figured out how to turn that into a couple of Presence Clubs and killed it in that. And then, then IBM called. And at the time I was like, just feeling kind of good about myself and went to IBM, did the same thing, turned to territory like 18 months. But what happened at IBM, which was interesting was I'll never forget doing my, my quarterly business review in front of all these guys who were like way my senior. I mean, I was one of the youngest guys there. I had Oracle breath. So I, they constantly told me to tone it down because everyone had their pension, you know? So there's like, just shut up and don't make it, don't work too hard. <laughs> don't make me work hard. Yeah. Don't make me work harder. Don't make me look bad. <laughs> True story. Um, Anyway, I went to my QBRs and I was like, wait a minute. You know, at the time, like uh, we got, we didn't, we didn't implement software. And I don't know if any of this stuff is still there. It's been, it's been almost a decade, but, um, but you know, it, it was like where you, uh, I, I, so I would sell the software and then I'd have to get an implementation partner to implement the software, mm -hmm. but they also could sell the software. And I'm like, well, that conflicts. That's weird. And they go, no, no, no. You get paid on whatever they sell. I go, how much? Oh, exactly the same amount that you get paid if you sell it. So mm -hmm. I put together my quarterly business review. I was like, wait, what? Like, I don't. So I was like, well, here's my plan. I'm going to find five cats that worked. They all used to work at IBM for like 20 years. So I'm like, why would I learn this crap? They already know it. And I get paid the same. So I, I found like a, some partners, put that plan together. I go, look, I'm going to find these people. I'm going to train them. I'm going to do this. We're going to work together. And I'm going to get these guys. I'm going to 5X myself. Right. And it works when to flip yeah, this yeah. territory and they laughed me out of the room. And I was like, am I crazy? Like, it just seems too logical. Like, I don't know. Right. Like, so we did that. And in 18 months, we flipped it and made a pile of, of cash that then helped me fund BBG. And because, uh, I, sorry, my phone's ringing, because, um, uh, I had some free time. So what happened is I had all this time, like, you know, cause these guys were doing all the selling. All I had to do is just get on a couple calls. You know, I had to, process of paperwork or whatever, show up to internal meetings and just kick it. And we didn't have a, a, an existing office here. So we went to Coco, which is a co-working space. Yeah. We got to meet all of these really cool founders and inventors who were great at running companies and all that, but they, they sucked at sales because it just was foreign to them. And I was like, well, hell, I can do that. And I got to know them. And then they're like, well, why don't you start your own company? And I was like, because I don't know how. And they're like, well, we can teach you that. Like, like I said, that. Pah. We could teach you that. How about you teach us this and we'll teach you that. And then I did. So that's what, that's how BBG was launched with zero business plan, zero focus, zero, whatever. And, and cause I didn't know that. And yeah. because they were good at the process stuff. So I was out uh, ice fishing with a couple of my buddies, the buddies that I actually worked with at Oracle and went to Australia with sitting in my ice fishing house. And they're like, Hey, we gotta, we're going to take, uh, we're going to take this product to the cloud 
and we need to build a team. Do you know some good people? I'm like, yeah, man, I could, I could do that. Like, I, I could do that. They're like, cool. What's, what would be your fee? And I was like, what do you mean? They're like, yeah, you get like 20% of base salary if you help us do this. And I was like, what? Really? How many, I'm like, how many people? Like 20. So that was the start of EVG. I was like, right. yeah, man, like I can do that. And I didn't know how, I could, how to do that. I didn't have any paperwork, but I did do recruiting, you know, a bunch of years before at McKinley. So I'm like, I could figure this out. And sure enough, we cobbled together an amazing team. Um, and then Lead Pages and Field Nation, and these other companies called, or I was connected with them. And that was it. So we were a recruiting agency. We've been a consulting agency. Then thanks to Coffee and Closers, yeah. which is kind of a hobby that we started just, you know, I mean, yeah, awareness, but I wasn't bright enough to, to like think that through. I just like, oh, I think it'd be fun to do a podcast. So we did a podcast and we uh, ended up having it be live because all the people that were asking me for help now, I couldn't help all of them because it was actually working. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I'm like, well, but why don't you come into this room once a month and we'll record it? Actually, we, that was Gario that brought that to the table. We didn't even think of the recording it. That's how uh, really when I say we kind of wing this for a while, it was <laughs> super wing. I didn't even think to record the damn thing. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so we uh, we um, had the room filled up. You were our, you were our second guest, weren't I think you? I was second. Yeah, yeah. 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 Ger- Garrett Kramer, I had him on. And the idea was I was going to just talk to these people. It wasn't intended to be a show. And then I was like, yeah, but I've never been a manager. I should probably have. So I had Garrett. That's how this whole thing started. And then Gario who worked at Coco at the time, right before we went on, he goes, Hey, we should record this. I was like, sure. Why not? Why not? <laughs> so you put it on and that's how the podcast started. <laughs> oh, I love it. Well, that, and that's what closest mean, meeting started. Right. So that's where it all kind of just snowballed and, and, you know, you built up uh, your personal brand and then uh, you transitioned from BBG to closers mm-hmm. uh, to bring it all together and make it one brand. So talk a little bit about what is, what is closers media today? Yes. So Closers Media today, due to our production and all the things that we've done, what we do now is we design uh, mini series, podcasts, webinar, whatever, you name it, um, to, to invite your, we call it spotlight prospecting, to invite your ICP, your ideal client profile to be on. Right. And we kind of reverse engineer and kind of skip the, the icky sales stuff to go right with building relationships. And we do this as an outbound or a an outsourced service. Mm-hmm. So we build the whole, we, we work with you obviously to, to find your ideal client. We build our pockets, we do all the stuff. And then we reach out on your behalf. We invite these folks to be on whatever it is we decide to design for you. Mm-hmm. Um, and we sell, you know, we, we at close, we try to, to begin it at the end where we're not in the, the we always say we're not in the, the podcasting business. We're not in the webinar business. We're in the business of conversion. We're in the business of getting those rela- new relationships that we help design for you um, into, into happy paying customers. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of where, where we end. So how we do prospecting is a little bit different. It anchors to one of those things as a true, genuine reason to, to, to be on it. But the magic is in all the setup and stuff and all the outposts and all the scripting, and all the stuff that we design to really sell you m- meetings. You know, what we say is we're going to sell you business conversations with people that match your key criteria. And, and because of that, there's a higher likelihood that, that they close. And then on top of that, we also, for those people that, that, that need help with conversion, because not everybody needs that two different buckets, right? Some people need, I need converse, more conversations uh, with my ICP that I can close. And some people are like, you know what, we've got a great marketing team, plenty of conversations. I just, I cannot convert these into paying customers. And for that, we have like workshops and courses and things that people can take that are very specific to the, the, the specific muscle in mm-hmm. your sales process that needs to be built back up. You know, we used to do it back in the day, like figuring this all out. We do like an end to end prospecting to closing. And we realize that not everybody needs help with all aspects of the sales process. They just need help uh, qualifying in the front, or they just need help negotiating, or they just need help with uh, putting together proposals or proposing for that matter that, you know, that results and yields in closed business. And so we handle for, for those people that have either one of those needs, we, we handle all that. And I love the, the, you were talking to me about this the other day about this, this um, lead gen offering around the podcast. And, and I've worked with, and 
I've consulted with clients and I've tried to hire lead gen organizations. And oh. I mean, it generally sucks, right? Yep. Like it, sucks. it is just a complete shit show with like, you, you don't know what you're getting from a talent side of, of things. And then you don't know what their scripts are. And it, it's, it's an extension of your brand, right. As, yep. a, as a person that's hiring them. So to me, I, I like the very, the very detailed approach that you're taking to that. I think it's a pretty cool way to, to handle that. Thanks, man. I mean, you, you may, may, may or may not know this at BBG when we were doing fractional VP of sales work more on the doing than, than building, mm -hmm. um, we were doing it. So I don't love to prospect. I've been a cat on most accounts. I'm uh, sorry, key account director on most ac accounts. So I had people do that for me um, and I don't love to do it, but I have to do it. And so do our clients. And so we built it around a way that I love to prospect, which mm -hmm. is an in invitation-based prospecting, not cold outreach. Do you know what I mean? Yep. And when we were doing uh, BBG, I hired, dude, I, I had to hire 10 to 15 outsourced prospecting groups or whatever they were called, lead gen groups or whatever. And they were mostly garbage, not all of them, but most of them were garbage. And yeah. like you said, it really poos on your brand. You know, if, if, you know, someone that has a fake email or you can go to their LinkedIn and realize they don't work for you. You know what I mean? It just looks yeah, weird. Yeah. We, we reach out as closers. So we're designing a new thing for, for, you know, this client, this is what they do. We think you'd be a fantastic, you know, blah, 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 to be on the show. Um, would you be open to having a, you know, conversation with you? I get to know your conversation, you know, around this and that. And, and so we're very clear and upfront to say they target people like you, like yeah. they serve people like you. So that's not a secret. Okay. We're not. So when we, you start talking about business, you're not going to be shocked because there's no guarantee that, you know, it may not make sense to have you on the show. Honestly, like we may right. have been off. We blame yeah. ourselves for that. Not our clients though. And it tends to really yield really great conversations because it's, there's no surprises. It's very natural. And it, it begins, sales begins with the conversation and that's what we sell. We sell business conversations that tend to close because you're jumping right to a relationship. You, you, I mean, I'm on your podcast. You've been in mine. Right. It just strengthens the bond. I don't know how or why. Just you just get down to the to the reels, and uh, it's been really impactful for our clients. And hell, we're doing it for ourselves. So everything that we we do, yeah, yeah. our scripts, everything we test first, so we yeah. know they work or they don't, and then we change them if they don't. And I love the the just the. the I've seen the evolution of what closers at, you know, even when it was BBG and, and I really feel you found your sweet spot here. And these two, these two specific offerings of really being able to leverage your skills, you as, as the CRO chief revenue officer and co-founder and, and, um, being able to help with those the scripts and help with the conversion and all those things. But then also on the front end where so many people really do suck is trying to get people in the door and have those conversations. Yeah. Uh, I think that's just, you know, kind of a cradle to grave approach that I, I really love. Well, I sucked at it. Like I'll be the first to say, you know, I wasn't that great. Once you got someone to turn my way, my close ratio was through the roof, but uh, I, so I'm, I'm as humble as, you know, I'm a person too. Like you can't be good at it. Not everyone's good at everything in sales. Right, right. If people are being honest, they're probably better at some things and prospecting. I just wasn't, was never that good at it. And uh, this allows me to prospect without feeling like I am, you know, yeah. and, yeah. and my prospects to not feel like they're being prospected. That's, sure. that's probably the most important thing. They're like, yeah, hell yeah, I'll be on that show. That sounds kind of fun. Cool. Right. Conversation goes towards the immediate need. Does it go towards immediate need? We decide, hey, let's let's do this. I think it'd be a fun show. Or I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't. Maybe I was off on whatever. It doesn't matter. It's just it's so easy, natural. It's 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 brilliant. I love it. It's I'm the most proud of this offering, probably of anything that we've ever built. Yeah, yeah, and it just feels good, right? Yeah. I did. That's the one thing that I like about this is that it doesn't feel nothing feels forced. Yeah, man. Well, thanks for yeah. bringing that up. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right. Uh, well, I always like to address a little bit of like what the future is. I feel like this is the, you're addressing the future, right? That's something I've never even heard of. That is a very new offering that nobody else does. I think that's it's so new that I think that is a little bit of the future is having this full cradle to grave approach to to sales training and sales consulting. So I think that's a, a great way to handle that. Um, that's my hard transition to go into uh, nine questions uh, oh boy. because we are, we're pushing up on the clock here yep. and you and I could probably just sit here and rattle on for hours, but our listeners got shit to do. So uh, <laughs> I'm going to hopefully I try and keep this under an hour. So we're going to, we're going to jump right into nine questions. Are you ready? I'm ready. Can you confirm that you have no idea what I'm about to ask you? I can confirm. In fact, 
I'm usually good on my toes, but I'm a little, little scared. I'm All right, scared. good. Well, I, that, I like to hear that. That's awesome. All right. Uh, number one, uh, what is the one thing that you own that you wish you didn't? Uh, I would say, uh, what was my snowblower? I hated that damn thing. It never did its job. <laughs> Was it an old one or was it a, was it a decent one or was it just, uh, well, just I'm just not very mechanical. So it's not, oh, you, I mean, yeah. I'm sure it works. If you had it, it'd probably work great. But for me <laughs> and because, because the way it was built it uh, on the, on the concrete, there's all these jagged because our concrete's old. So it would like hit me in the gut. Like, like yeah. cause, you know, you get up early in the morning to blow it all of a sudden you're already pissed anyway. And then you're uh, uh, just keeping these gut shots. I mean, if I could have lifted it up, I would have chucked it across the, the driveway a long time ago. <laughs> how many, how many times have you changed the spark plugs on, on your, uh, on your snowblower? <laughs> never not a, never mind that's not a question all right uh number two uh what is your what was your favorite cartoon growing up uh gi joe for sure right god that was that was such a good cartoon uh, i would i had to get to, so my parents dropped me off my dad got had to be at work at like five in the morning in yeah. far well detroit or dilworth which is right outside of fargo 45 minutes she'd drop us off i mean two hours before the sun would come up have the time we go back to sleep, but I would have them wake me up when G actually would have it on. We'd turn it on. We'd my brother and I, would, we'd only kids there at the babysitter, like for two hours. Yeah. And all of a sudden, like seven GI Joe would come on. And I remember cranking it up. So it would wake us up when we heard the theme song. Oh, such a sweet, sweet show that uh, it's, it's funny. I was uh, thinking about this the other day. So I was, I don't know what I saw the, the theme song come up on YouTube or something like that. And it reminded me of a time my, my mom used to leave. My dad left super early in the morning at like five in the morning too, for work. And my, my mom, she would leave at like six 45. Well, GI Joe came on at seven and, but the bus picked me up at seven 30. And oh. so GI Joe came on. And I would watch GI Joe and I knew when GI Joe was just about to be done the, before the last sequence, uh, the last set of commercials, I had to run out for the bus. Well, remember the 1-800 number you could call to, or 900, I guess, and then talk to one of the characters. Yes. I, I did that and it, and, and it, it cost my parents $38. And I thought <laughs> it was like, it, I thought they were going to kill me and uh, I'll never forget that. That was uh, all GI Joe related. So do you remember when transformers, so transformers would have been my second favorite. Um, do you remember that? I don't remember it was when they came out the movies or whatever, which were horrible, but anyway, yeah. um, where you could call Optimus prime and <laughs> yes. he would say whatever you want in Optimus prime's voice. So we were in high school when this went on. So we were just, we were calling and going, <laughs> Hey, check, you know, and so Optimus prime would call their landline. And it would, it would, they would read a script. So we would be like, I want to tickle your like gross, <laughs> terrible things, but it would be an optimist's <laughs> prime's voice. And so parents that would pick up, they're like, what the hell? <laughs> uh, prank calls. I, oh, I miss those days. Can't beat that in the eighties. Uh, all right. Yeah. Number three, uh, when was the last time you laughed so hard you cried? Oh, Saturday. We had a big party in our backyard and I fell over in a chair and I literally did cry. I laughed uh, so hard that I cried and I don't even remember what it was, but it was so funny. Yeah. So Saturday, I'd like to, I try and show myself with people that make me laugh so hard. I cry. Yeah, me too. That's like a uh, life goal, you know? Yeah. Uh, hence probably the reason why you and I are friends. Yep. Uh, all right. What is the strangest thing you've ever eaten? Oh, trying to think of it. Well, a minnow. I, my, my dad one? and I used to have, yeah, a live one. We used to sit yeah. in the fish house and we would, we would have minnow eating contests, which I wish I didn't, I wish I didn't tell say out loud on your show, but yeah, that's, that's disgusting. That's just, I've yes. done it. I've done it once, but that's it. And it's only because I've had too much to drink. All right. What is, uh, what do you do to keep yourself grounded? I hang out with my kids as much as humanly possible. They're the yeah. only reason I do any of this. And that wasn't the case. We started doing this before my first was even born. And it's funny how things change, which is why I think our offerings gotten a lot tighter. And we know what we're doing these days versus just winging it. Cause I don't want to waste time because yeah. every, every minute that I'm not like I, that I'm not spending with them feels like, and then that, I, didn't, I just won't finish that thought, but like, I, that's where I want to be, spend my time is with yeah. them. Uh, great answer. Um, what, uh, what is your favorite hobby? Ah, uh, I love playing music, but I, okay. You know what my new favorite hobby is, is, uh, Nordic sauna. You, you know yeah. what that is? So like you go in this hot, you know, sauna, it's, it's wood fired. And then you jump in a cold tub right afterwards. And I love it. It is like, 
makes me feel just alive. It just, it's the greatest discovery, man. We did it a bunch before COVID and now we're, we're doing it here and it's just, mm, it's, it's working its way South. I, I know that was a big thing up in the Duluth area for the last couple of years. I've heard about it, but that's great that it's working its way this way. All you got to do is build a sauna or buy a sauna, whatever, and then yeah. go to Menards and buy like the, the big or home uh, fleet farm. They got those big like troughs, like oh, there's yeah. a rubber trough. Yeah. And you just plop your ass in that. And <laughs> I'll tell you what, first thing in the morning, nothing better. Or at really? night, you can, you'll sleep like a baby. Really? All mm-hmm. right. Yeah, fun fact. Uh, what is your biggest pet peeve? I don't like, <laughs> I don't like when someone's telling a story. That's probably maybe hundred percent true, maybe a little embellished and somebody cuts in and goes, Oh, and they like fact check them. I think that's just bullshit, especially if it's who cares. You know what I mean? Like right, it's just right. a story of like, like if it's in business or you're teaching your kid like science, answering science questions and you're like, ah, geese are ambiguous. They don't have genitals like that. <laughs> that would, I don't, I don't buy into that. But like, if it's, if it's like just some story that's always telling, like I, you could imagine, I heard a bunch of stories on Saturday at this party we had, and I was like, "This is great." And then somebody cut in, like fact check them. I was like, "Oh, yeah, boo!" Right. <laughs> boo is right. I wanted to believe the fake version of that. That sounded way better. <laughs> right, back off. Let us live in fantasy world just for a little exactly. bit. Exactly. Right. Uh, what is the average time you go to bed and the average time you wake up? Uh, so, this is very. I go to bed late and I wake up late, so <laughs> that's. You know, I wake up at about eight and I go to bed oh. at about 11 to noon or 11 to noon. I go to bed at about 11 to midnight. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's not that bad. You're still getting eight hours of sleep. I need to get eight hours of sleep. That's, yeah, me that's too. the only way this, this brain will operate, man. I can't be sleepy. It'd be worthless. Yeah. That's all I care about. And if you're, so if you get up at eight, let's say you get up at seven fifty-five, you do your Nordic sauna thing. You're like ready to rock and roll by eight fifteen when everybody else is up at six o'clock in the morning, it takes them two hours to wake up. So listen, you've got a little life hack there. I think so. My kids, I mean, they, you know, they, they don't get up that, they get up fairly early, but they don't go to school till nine. That's part of it. I'm like, who designed And then they're done at three. So I'm like, who with a real job could ever do this? Like, I don't know how people do it. How do you learn anything in that shorter period of time? (laughs) Well, she's sick. So they're not, they're learning how to like tie shoes and make armpit (laughs) farts, you know? All right. Last one. What is your go-to for inspiration? Jesus. Like I right. cuss like a sailor and I, I like to have a good time. Everyone knows that. But um, back at, at the end of the day, Jesus is my anchor yeah. and I'm not ashamed to say it. Some people are, but I'm not. I love it. Uh, brother, uh, where can people find you? Well, they're not going to find anything on our website, closersmedia.com right now, because the offering is so new that uh, we haven't even updated the site yet. So if you want to learn more about anything we've discussed today from a business standpoint, my email is Mikkeli, M-I-C-K-E-L-I at closersmedia.com or hit me up on LinkedIn and I'd love to have a conversation with you. Awesome. Yep. You are very easy to find on LinkedIn. Uh, and if people can't find you on LinkedIn, then they're spelling your name wrong. <laughs> oh, I appreciate that, man. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, well, I cannot thank you enough uh, for being on the show. You've had me on your show and I've I've been uh, a reoccurring guest on, on closers and stuff. And it's so nice to be able to have you and spot like you for a change. Uh, that is the funnest part about this whole thing, as far as I'm concerned. And plus you're just such a great dude. And, and I've gotten to know you so well over the years and I just want to be able to share you with everybody else. And, and uh, I'm so honored to have you on the show, buddy. Honors all mine, man. And you know how I feel about you. You know, it's, I appreciate you inside and out. And I appreciate, you know, the chance to be on your show and spotlight the way you do it. I think you do a great job, man. You're really good at this. It's been fun. Thanks, brother. You're my, I think you're like my 10th guest or something. So uh, uh, thanks a lot for being on. Uh, I am Aaron Eggert. On behalf of Mikolai Bador, this has been the Power of Nine podcast. And I want to thank you for the privilege of your time. Cheers. Mm-hmm.